Hello and welcome to Learn A-Level Biology for free with Miss Estrick. I'm going to be going through synapses and neuromuscular junctions in this video. If you are new here then click subscribe to keep up to date on the latest videos. So first of all just a reminder from GCSE about what a synapse is and that is the gap between two neurons. So you would have, we learned about action potentials traveling along a neuron, and I'll link action potentials up here if you haven't seen that video yet. Now an action potential cannot pass the gap. So instead, at this point, mechanisms have to be put in place to release a neurotransmitter, which is a chemical that can diffuse across this gap, bind to the next neuron and then trigger an action potential to start in that neuron. And in that way, the impulse can be passed all the way through the different neurons and to the coordinator. So how this actually works then, we'll go through it step by step. This is most likely to come up in an exam as a long answer question. So I've tried to break it down into the four or five marking point statements that you would need to include on an exam question. So it is quite a text heavy topic, this one. So the first thing is we said an action potential would arrive at the end of the neuron. Now we call the end of the neuron the synaptic knob. So this section here is the synaptic knob and an action potential would be arriving at that location in response to a stimulus. And what that causes to happen is there are calcium ion channels in the plasma membrane of the synaptic knob. And when that action potential arrives, it causes those calcium ion channels to open and we can see here these voltage gated calcium ion channels, they would open and therefore calcium ions will diffuse into the synaptic knob. So that's step one. Step two is what those calcium ions cause to happen. And what they cause to happen is within the synaptic knob, there are vesicles which contain the neurotransmitter. And when calcium ions are entering the synaptic knob, it causes these vesicles to move towards what we call the presynaptic membrane, because it's the membrane, the presynaptic knob, uh, before the synapse occurs. And once those vesicles fuse with the membrane, that is what causes the neurotransmitter to be released into the synapse. Now you only have the neurotransmitter in the presynaptic neuron. So therefore, neurotransmitter is only released at that side of the synapse. So for that reason, you end up with a very high concentration of neurotransmitter towards the presynaptic end of the synaptic cleft, which is what we call this gap. And as a result, diffusion occurs of that neurotransmitter and it moves towards or it diffuses towards the postsynaptic neuron. And that's what the information here is telling you. So because of that concentration gradient, the neurotransmitter diffuses down its gradient across the synaptic cleft and on the postsynaptic membrane, there are receptors complementary in shape to the neurotransmitter. And those receptors are only located on the postsynaptic neuron. So these two points within this uh, mint green box, you could be asked why is it that um, the impulse only travels in one direction or um, why is it the neurotransmitter only travels in one direction? And those are two key reasons. The vesicles are only found in the presynaptic neuron, so neurotransmitters only released from one side. And the receptors are only on the postsynaptic neuron, so they can only bind to that side. Now, on those receptors, there are also um, those are also attached to the sodium ion channels. So it's actually um, a protein, which is the sodium ion channel, which also contains the neurotransmitter receptor. And once the neurotransmitter is bound it causes these sodium ion channels on that postsynaptic membrane to widen. 
And because they're now wider, sodium ions that are within this synaptic cleft are able to move from the synaptic cleft and into the postsynaptic neuron. And if enough sodium ions diffuse in, then you could reach that minus 55 millivolt threshold to then trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. So that is what is happening. But the final step is, if those neurotransmitters remained permanently attached to the sodium ion channels, then you'll constantly be triggering an action potential and causing responses, even when maybe the stimulus isn't there anymore. So the last step is that neurotransmitter has to be broken down, recycled and reabsorbed back into the presynaptic neuron. And that is what the final step is. So there's enzymes which can break down the neurotransmitter. They can then be reabsorbed back into the presynaptic neuron, ready to be reused if and when another stimulus arrives or triggers an action potential to arrive. And that just leads us on to one example of a type of synapse, which is called the cholinergic synapse, which is the only example in detail you need to know about. It's exactly the process we went through. It's just you need to know the name of the neurotransmitter and the enzyme which breaks it down. So the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. That is what we have in here. And then the enzyme that can break it down is acetylcholine esterase. And that will break down the acetylcholine into choline and acetate. So those are the two molecules which will then be recycled back in to the presynaptic knob. And then they'll go towards making more acetylcholine. Now, one thing that I did say is that when the sodium ions diffuse in, if enough sodium ions diffuse in, then you will reach that minus 55 millivolt threshold to trigger an action potential. But if you don't have enough sodium ions diffusing in, then an action potential won't be triggered. And this is where the concept of summation comes in. And summation is this idea of adding up. So it's this rapid build-up, this addition of neurotransmitters in the synapse to help generate the action potential that is required to then enable the action potential to travel along the next neuron. There's two types, and we'll go through both, spatial and temporal. So this is what is needed to add up to sufficient concentrations of neurotransmitters to open up sufficient numbers of sodium ion channels to trigger an action potential. So we'll go through both in a bit more detail, but we've got a summary just here. Spatial summation is when you actually have multiple presynaptic neurons attaching to one synapse and one postsynaptic neuron. And because you have multiple, that means you have multiple quantities of neurotransmitter being released and you'll be able to cause more sodium ion channels to open. Temporal summation, so tempo, if you study music, tempo is timing. Temporal summation is different. You only have one neuron attached to the next and what temporal summation is, is when one neuron releases neurotransmitter repeatedly over a short period of time until that threshold is exceeded. So it's just one, but um, if you have a big enough stimulus or the stimulus is repeatedly being triggering that action potential, then you'll have lots and lots of neurotransmitter being released over time to trigger the action potential in the next neuron. So just to show you a bit more about that to do the temporal summation, we've got two examples here on the graph below. If it was just one action potential arriving at the presynaptic neuron, that doesn't release enough neurotransmitter to open enough sodium ion channels to trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. And we can see here they're measuring the potential difference in the pre and post synaptic neurons, and that's what we see on the graph.
So the threshold isn't met. However, temporal summation, this is where we're saying multiple action potentials arrive at the presynaptic neuron, and each of those will result in some neurotransmitter being released and some sodium ion channels on the postsynaptic neuron being opened. And eventually, as all of those add up, it does exceed the threshold and an action potential can occur. In contrast, spatial summation, it could just be one action potential is arriving, but each of these different presynaptic neurons has their own action potential arriving and therefore collectively they release enough neurotransmitter. So the next thing is there are actually what we call inhibitory synapses. Again, these work in exactly the same way. The key difference is when the neurotransmitter binds, it's actually binding to protein channels for chloride ions instead of sodium ion channels. And there will still be sodium ion channels with some neurotransmitter attaching to those, but the chloride ions are negative ions. So this combined effect of having chloride ions moving in, um, you also actually get some potassium ions being caused to move out at inhibitory synapses. And this combined effect results in the um, membrane potential or the um, potential difference of the post synaptic neuron becoming much lower than the resting potential of minus 70 and actually drops to about minus 80 millivolts which we'd class as hyperpolarization and therefore it makes it very unlikely that an action potential would be able to be triggered in that postsynaptic neuron because even with summation occurring you probably wouldn't get enough sodium ions entering to counteract that to get above minus 55 millivolts. So some synapses are inhibitory and that is actually not a disadvantage. The reason is we don't want to be responding to every single stimulus in our environment because it would overwhelm your senses um, and therefore you wouldn't be able to pick out what are the most vital changes to respond to. So neuromuscular junctions, this is a slight difference from what we were just looking at. It's still a synapse because it is a gap. However, it's not a gap between two neurons. So this is what you find right at the end of your reflex arc. So you have your stimulus detected by receptors. That will then link to the sensory neuron. That links to the coordinator where you have the relay neuron. And then finally, you get your motor neuron and your effector. And in a neuromuscular junction, the neuron is the motor neuron, and it's a gap between that and the muscle. So that's what this is. It's still a synapse, but instead of neuron to neuron, it's neuron to muscle. Works in the same way, though. The key differences, though, are that, uh, I'll go through some more on the next slide, but just to point out, you still have this idea of neurotransmitter being released, and they attach to the receptors, but instead of triggering an action potential in the muscle fibre, it triggers the muscles to contract. So you could be asked to summarise the key differences and similarities between a synapse, and I've just put in a cholinergic synapse there, but this could actually be for any synapse, um, and a neuromuscular junction. So the main thing they have in common is they both result in unidirectional um, flow or one direction movement. And this is because you only have the neurotransmitter being released from the presynaptic neuron and the receptors are only on the postsynaptic or the muscle membrane. Neuromuscular junctions can only be excitatory, whereas the other synapses could be excitatory, meaning they trigger an action potential, or they could be inhibitory as well. Neuromuscular is when the motor neuron connects to the muscle, whereas synapse is where any two neurons are connecting. Neuromuscular junction is the end point because that takes you to the effector, the muscle. Whereas with a synapse, it's connecting to a new neuron, so you are triggering 
another action potential. Lastly, neuromuscular junction, that is where the acetylcholine binds the receptors on the muscle fiber membrane, whereas with the synapse, it's binding to the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So I've just put in bold the key differences to watch out for in an exam question so that your clarity of answer is on point. So that is it for synapses, neuromuscular junctions and summation.